Hello, everyone, and inside today's Locked On Canadians, the Habs have signed Joshua Watt to an entry-level contract. Cole Caulfield has his swagger back. And when is Jordan Harris going to make his official Montreal Canadiens debut? For Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 584 of Locked On Canadians. As always, thank you for making us your first listen wherever you listen to your podcast, or if you are watching on YouTube, thank you. Please make sure you like, subscribe, comment on all the videos. That helps us so, so much continue to grow uh, this YouTube channel here. I am one of your hosts. I am Scott Metlin. I'm joined, as always, by the active stick, Laura Saba. And Laura, it was an off day for the Canadians in terms of games but that doesn't mean we don't have so, so much to discuss on the show today. But first off, how is my wonderful co-host uh, feeling on this uh, cold, dreary Wednesday here in Buffalo? There's a freezing rain warning here in Montreal at the time that we're recording this. Hopefully, by the time people are listening to this, it'll be gone. But other than that, excited about Josh Wara signing his entry-level contract with the Canadians. It seems like a steal. He's a fifth-rounder. Seems like a steal to me. I don't know. Yes, uh, there was the news that came from TVA Sports earlier this morning that he was likely to uh, be signing. Uh, and I think a lot of people go, yeah, okay, sure. But uh, it came down the pipeline and he's been so good this year for Sherbrooke in the uh, QMJHL. Is one of the, I think he's the leading scorer, if not one of the leading scorers in the QMJHL. Uh, and he's just been on a tear since he was one of the last cuts from the Canadian World Junior Team, similar to what uh, former Canadians goaltender Mike McNiven did when he was cut from Team Canada. And my first thought is, this is a good thing. This is a really nice pick. And uh, we've talked a little bit about drafting and this and that in the previous regime. All things considered, if we remove the first round right now and look at everything from the 2021 draft, there's a lot of sneaky good picks in there, and Joshua Wise is one of them that Trevor Timmons and his staff kind of put went out on a, on a limb for there, and it's paid off in a big way for them. It, I, it, It's not hard to look at this and go, yeah, this kid earned it, and Matt Drake, good friend of the show, guy who does uh, gifting and bottom six minutes for Eyes on the Prize, loves Joshua Wise. He watches pretty much every game he can because he does something amazing. Uh, and then Hattie, who does our uh, Catching the Torch series, did a nice little mini thread on Twitter that we will link to that kind of breaks down his strengths and weaknesses. So you, I highly recommend checking that out. But a very good way to start the morning uh, if you're a Montreal Canadiens fan. I absolutely agree. It was I don't think it was completely unexpected. I did think that was a little bit of a surprise because he's making so much noise, but it's also pretty early in his career, right? So I do think, though, that you pointed this out, Scott, is that he gives Laval a lot. You know, if if his season ends early, he can join the Rocket in their playoff push and beyond in the playoffs. I think I think more you were thinking about playoffs, right? Yeah, and that's the thing is it's like Sherbrooke should have a pretty solid run. Uh, Watt leads the league in assists with 56, and in third place with 50 is Riley Kidney, who is also a Habs prospect. He's fifth in goals with 36, and he's second in points with 92, one point behind uh, William Dufour, who is in first with 93. It's um, very impressive, and the biggest thing is – He's not getting these goals all on the power play. He's not even in the top five on that. He does lead the league in power play assist with 23, but at the same time, that means everything goes through Joshua Wah. And I saw a very interesting thing from Cap Friendly as they were talking about his signing earlier. Wah is still eligible to slide his contract, so the Habs can slide that a year and get an extra year out of that. And he does not have a games played bonus in the third year of his entry-level deal, 
This likely coincides with the hat when the Habs feel like he would be a full-time NHL player and they want to limit the bonuses and possible overages, which is really, really smart contract work from John Sedgwick, Jeff Gordon, and Kent Hughes. It's foresight in planning for in a couple of years when people are going to need bigger deals. Jordan Harris will be up for a contract in in the near future. Going to need to get him under the cap. Caden Primo is going to be, need to be on there. What are you going to do with Jake Allen? Uh, Cole Caulfield's up for a contract after the end of next season, I believe. There's a lot of young talent that's going to need new deals. And they're setting it up in a way that they can avoid doing kind of what happened with Toronto, where they had to pay so many bonuses. Things got co- yeah, exactly. Things got complicated overall. I agree with that. And you can't forget the Romanovs up for a contract negotiation this off season, right? And this is really interesting because a lot of our, our commenters on the last episode on YouTube were talking a little bit about, you know, Jeff Petrie and all of that. And I think for us, the big buzz word of the off season is going to be cap space because they want to move out some people for a lot of reasons whether they're not a fit in montreal anymore whether they're not part of the future plans whether those players have earned the right to play somewhere where they might be contending faster than the montreal canadians in order to make room for all these young players and prospects that they have so for me it's going to be really exciting to see who they prioritize in this off season, like which set of players, the veterans, the young ones, obviously, if you can't trade somebody, if you don't have a good trading partner, or if you don't get good value, and this, this front office has made it clear that they will not trade before they get the value that they want. You saw when they were openly selling in uh, or around the trade deadline, they were openly the sellers, everybody knew that they were headed for the basement. And they were like, no, we, we're still going to wait until we get what we want. And they created a bidding war for players that they were openly trying to unload. And not only that, they created a bidding war for players they said they wanted to keep. And then they got value for them. So I, I don't see them buying people out. I don't see them trading people just for the sake of trading them. I, I expect them to get value back. And I want to see how they open up some cap space. Because you're right, Like next year might not be that big of a problem. But the coming years are going to be a little bit tight. And you want to structure it so that all your good young players are getting good at the same time. So you've got a few years of contention and you're not up against the cap. So you have to use those LTIR loopholes like Tampa has to do. And uh, one thing we did discuss this on Twitter is that Watt is eligible to join the Rocket. We uh, Laura mentioned that a little bit earlier in this segment as well. And it's going to be interesting to see how he rotates into the lineup here, uh, depending on how the Phoenix do, because the Rocket are getting healthy. It's a very strong lineup when it's fully ready. But a guy like Wah allows them to rest some of their veteran bodies who might be a little bruised and dinged up there. And you get a chance to see him play at the professional level. I thought he looked really good in the preseason and in the rookie se- uh, the rookie camp games. But now he's going to play against older guys when he gets his chance at the end of the season here, potentially. So... Uh, as things develop on that, we will obviously keep you posted on everything. But he's not the only young uh, sniper in the Canadians organization. In the headlines today, we have a little bit of a discussion about how Cole Caulfield got his swagger back. And that's coming up next. But first, after months of playing, college basketball has determined the final four teams and will determine this year's national champion this upcoming week. And betonline.net is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info from the latest odds and props to contests and everything in between. They have you covered and bet on remains the best spot for all your sports development, including podcasts, breaking news reviews across all leagues. And it's not just basketball. You can get hockey covered. You can get NFL props on the draft covered uh, right down to your favorite live betting and favorite Vegas casino games. They have everything there. So head to the website or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. Bet online where the game starts. All right. So I, I feel like it's mean that this keeps happening, but we continue to have to talk about uh, the previous regime, not only on the bench, but also in the front office. And I'm going to read a pair of tweets here that are are on the same story about Cole Caulfield. And I'm not 100% sure where this article came from at first. But um, here's the direct quote. I had a great meeting with Cole Caulfield last week. I sat down with him in the locker room and then told him, 
You're the gold in the bank for the rest of us, Cole. He has such an amazing personality, this kid. He's always laughing, dancing, joking, laughing at himself. He's cool right now. And then I said to him, you have to show that. You have to be yourself in front of the media, I told him. Yeah, you get to go up for press briefings and you shut up. That's not what I want. And then he starts laughing. You really want me to show my personality. You know that it has not always been like here. And that comes from, I believe, an article or an interview with Chantal Maccabee. Yeah. So she was on a radio appearance, I believe, a radio or a podcast appearance and, and being asked a lot of stuff. And this came up in the conversation. And then uh, a paper, a publication tra- put a transcript online of it. Okay. So, yeah, so it's definitely, uh, and I believe the Canadians may have linked to it or retweeted it or something. I'm not sure, 100%, but um, definitely this is something that uh, has been, people have obviously been talking a lot about since it came out on, I think it was Tuesday morning. Yes, and the thing is, it uh, it doesn't get better if you're the old Canadians regime, because Arpin Basu uh, quoted that tweet, uh, and he says, Chantel shared the same story with me the other day said previous management, whether that was Mark Bergevin or the head of PR, um, um, whose name I'm Paul Wilson or whoever it was, told Caulfield to go up there and trot out cliches and be as bland as possible. Current management views that uh, differently. And my first thought is, how do you take a bundle of excitement and pixie sticks like Cole Caulfield, whose infectious kind of attitude when he joined this team where he was all smiles all the time, Tell him to go up in front of everyone and say, be boring, be, be not you, be what the Canadian's image of you is, and not even the Canadian's image, because the Canadian's image of him is clearly what he's doing right now, or they're goofing around out in the ocean uh, instead of being at practice and stuff like that. How do you tell someone to do that? And it makes a lot of sense that the things we've seen over the last decade before Hughes and Gorton took over this team, looking at it and going, everything makes sense now. Max Pacioretty was never like the most exciting guy in the world, but at the same time, he had enough of a dry humor about him that he always had, you know, fun with this team and everything. And then he just became this very, I don't want to say withdrawn, but very plain and boring individual. And we don't need to relitigate the whole PK Subban thing again, but you hear things about this, about Cole Caulfield, and then you go, okay, no wonder things just were the way that they were. And I know that it's in the past now and there's no fixing that, but I'm very glad that uh, Chantel runs the communications department now that Hughes and Gorton see these players as individual people, not interchangeable pieces or that are, you are a B and C Uh, B is out, so you need to do A and B today. Please just keep it, you know, milk toast here and just do nothing. And Cole Caulfield's swagger coming back with the firing of Dominique Ducharme and and obviously the firing of Mark Bergevin and that entire staff, it's becoming less and less that it's just Martin St. Louis a good coach, which maybe he is, and maybe he's, you know, just getting the benefits of this and more – Hey, the Canadians just want you to play hockey and be happy, Cole. And I think that's all that he needs in this life. And that seems to be working out really well for him. So uh, him getting his swagger back is very good news for the Canadians and bad news for everyone else around the NHL. I think at some point, the NH- I don't know why, and it might be the NHL as a whole. I don't know when the Montreal Canadiens went from the Canadians of the 70s where you knew they partied all night every night and then showed up and won a Stanley Cup. And they were known for being partiers and, 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 and then it became this organization where everybody had to follow certain rules. And I think the NHL as a whole is kind of like that. It's allergic to personality. It became very, very at the risk of making another accident, accidental phallic Freudian slip. It became a very stuffy organization. Um, it, 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 it makes sense to a certain extent where it's like, don't stand out in this, in this sport, in this industry, in this market. But at the same time, and I think a lot of teams around the NHL are kind of learning that, uh, is that you need to sell these personalities. And this is like a little bit of a peek behind the curtain. I once applied for a job at the NHL. And um, one of the, one of the things that I discussed in that interview was for a social media job was the players exist. The personalities exist. And I would like to 
sort of showcase what they are like as people, not necessarily as players. And this is something where obviously that didn't materialize. It's very different. Like, like things are very different now. This was, this would have been like five, six, maybe even seven years ago. But I just remember at the time thinking players might not be boring. It's true that there's a lot of them that are just some boring dudes. Right. But there are, players with personality and that personality it seems to get squished out of them squashed quashed out of them maybe by the time they make it so that they're at the cold coffee level right like they're entering the nhl they're poised to really really start making noise and all of that and i just i find that we're not like that anymore fans demand more with with things like social media with you know you could go on on the Habs facebook and see what they're up to they post tiktoks now um and it's not just it's not just the Habs. it's 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 the teams as a whole like for example the columbus blue jackets social team is always showcasing patrick liney's outfits um they're trying to do fat they're trying to make fashion a thing and they're trying to sort of like players are, are sort of showing their personalities a lot more and fans are responding well to it because as a demographic, they're, they're they're trying to appeal to younger fans, but also even even the existing fans are just kind of like, yeah, we know that they're not all the same. They're not all cookie cutter. And I'd rather they say something interesting than stand and say the other team wanted it more, we, you know, 100%, 110% effort, blah, blah, blah. Nobody wants to hear that. And the thing about Cole Caulfield is that I always had the impression that he's a shy guy. And he's really not. Like, I didn't... I didn't know that you could make like numerous fan cams of his dance moves and things like that. <laughs> I, I really didn't. And like, you see him play around with his teammates and all of that. Like he's not a shy kid. He's energetic. He's fun. He's interesting. And you know, like, like if I'm a younger hockey fan, like that's the kind of thing that appeals to me. And so I think, you know, when, when, when I, I think, the translation like gold in the bank i think i think it's money in the bank is the expression right he is money in the bank for the canadians i think that's um that's pretty obvious like fans want to know that you know when you see a player play really well and then come off the ice and like have that swagger that makes you like him even more especially if he's playing against teams that you hate you know like come off a game against boston or toronto you scored two goals three goals maybe the overtime winner and you're coming off and you you've got that swagger you've got that cheerful outlook and all of that the fans are going to be celebrating that with you and so in a couple of seasons we're going to start seeing the playoffs but if we don't these are the kinds of things that are going to entertain us anyway i've gone on a rant so long i didn't realize that i've got blown way past the segment <laughs> time limit that is i'm just very very passionate about allowing people to be themselves even in a sport that is too scared of being interesting and the thing is, if the Canadians can do this, every other team can do this right now. And I know that the team is, we know they're not good. We understand that the Canadians are not good. But at the same time, they're having fun, which is how you avoid creating a rot in the organization. Then you get the Buffalo Sabres, the Edmonton Oilers, uh, Toronto for most of the late 2000s. Like, you have to avoid that. That's important. Let these guys be who they are. However, the Canadians are back in action on the day that you're hearing this on Thursday. They are playing the Carolina Hurricanes. We have news and notes from practice, including could we see Jordan Harris's debut all coming up in one second? All right. So the Canadians got the hell out of Florida uh, after last night's game and arrived in Raleigh, North Carolina for a game today. Uh, we're going to run down the quick news and notes from the actual Canadians organization uh, through the thing there, which, by the way, thank you. We do love all of this, by the way. The amount of transparency and openness now is fantastic. Uh, Ryan Paling returned to practice after being out since March 13th against Philadelphia. Jake Evans did not skate due to an upper body injury suffered in the game against Florida. Mackenzie Weger, you, you are on my list, sir, again. Uh, Paling won't play, however, but he is getting back to practice. Tyler Pitlick will return, though, after suffering an upper body injury in that game against Toronto. He was wearing a full visor in practice. And the big news of the day, it was Jordan Harris's first uh, practice with the Canadians on the ice. And I got to say, I really do wonder if we might see him in the lineup on Thursday night. And if not, then this weekend at some point, just because it makes it makes sense to rotate some of these guys, whether it's him and Justin Barron rotating in and out or giving someone else like a Weidman or whatever the night off. 
it, there's a chance here to rotate and keep guys fresh. You're not getting even the vets banged up. And then you go into the off season where they got to recover and they don't get a chance to be as ready for the next season. It's a vicious cycle. Uh, I'm really excited to see kind of what the lineup looks like on uh, Thursday night here. We don't fully know because obviously it comes down to game time, morning skate, this, that, and the other thing, but Tyler Pitt looks back, which is fine, which is nice. You know, uh, with Evans being out, uh, Pitlick can fill in on the fourth line and be just fine. He's not going to be Jake Evans, but he'll be perfectly all right. Laura, um, you think we're going to see Harris on Thursday, or do you think they're going to wait a little bit and see if they can find that a lighter gap in the schedule? And by that, I mean the Ottawa Senators for him to kind of slide in the lineup. To be honest, I'm not really sure because I personally think that they want to get him in the lineup as soon as possible. But Carolina is another team that, you know, we talked about it on our last episode. The schedule from here on out is two Sens games and then a bunch of contenders. And it's going to be tough. And But at the same time, he just came off an NCAA tournament. He is in playing mode, right? Like he's in, he's in challenge mode. So I want to see him as soon as possible. But at the same time, I get it if they want to rest him. But you got to remember that Jeff Petrie's out indefinitely. So they do need defensemen at this point. And while we're talking about this, it just occurred to me that um, earlier today, I think it was, it might have been Renaud Lavoie, but uh, somebody was talking about how Jordan Harris didn't realize that his commitment to staying in university was going to cause such a, such a, worry or concern in the Montreal market um he played down the idea that there was any reason for him not to sign or leave Ooh, I have ranting to do about this because Go on. <laughs> I, I so I'm not naming names because we are not that podcast but I've seen a lot of people give credit that well Mark Bergevin drafted this person and then it is you know we should credit him for him signing under Kent Hughes's watch and my first thought is we were we're like four and a half, five months removed from if he wants to sign somewhere else, there is nothing I can do. And the news being that he hasn't been in contact with Harris or his agent at any point in time. I do not have to give credit for a guy who did not make a very strong effort to do so. And I'm still, I have the Canadians website pulled up behind me. While Harris's longstanding relationship with general manager Kent Hughes and that familiarity factor definitely played a role in his decision to ultimately sign with Montreal. There was more to it than that. The 21 year old defenseman says Hughes presented a vision that immediately caught his attention. And that's not credit you can give to Mark Bergevin because one, there was a vision, which means there was foresight and planning, which is not a Mark Bergevin thing. And Kent Hughes went there and he made that the first thing on his list, Harris and the, uh, guys playing in hockey East. So that would have been Sean F- or not Sean Farrell. He's in the ECAC, but in that Boston area, Luke Tuck, Jaden Struble, uh, obviously Jordan Harris. And then uh, obviously he was his son, Riley and Jack. And he made that a priority. He made Harris feel like he's a big part of the future of this team. And here's the thing is he might not be, he might not be a top pairing defenseman who helps them win a Stanley cup. But I'll be damned if I don't think he's going to be a regular NHL contributor. And I I don't feel the need to give credit to someone who was ready to throw in the towel when a player said, I'm going to see when, you know, things were kind of tough for him at that time. Four years of the NCAA. his degree which is fantastic for a young player but throwing the towel even six months ago on this whole thing and that's the thing it's like what's jordan harris gonna say really he's gonna be classy he's going to be the way that he's been trained to deal with media as a talented hockey player i personally think that the idea of the vision was really important And there's something to be said about something fresh and new, right? So yes, it's true that there was a long-standing relationship with the general manager. Uh, He was his family advisor, if I'm not mistaken. He was definitely, and and, you know, his his sons played, his sons played hockey with him or against him or whatever. There was an existing relationship, but at the same time, when you're drafted by an organization, it is the organization's responsibility to, to not just keep an eye on how you're developing, but also keep an eye on where your mood is. Like, are you ready to go pro? Do you think you're ready to go pro? We talked about, and this was a positive, obviously, like when Mark Bergevin spoke to Cole Caulfield a couple of years ago, and they both agreed that he should stay in the NCAA, 
And that turned out to be beneficial. They turned out to be right, but that communication has to go both ways. And for me, it might not even be that, you know, it was, it might not have even been Mark, Mark Bridgman's demeanor or anything like that, but looking at the team, when you're seeing a lack of a future with the team, you're obviously going to go to free agency or going to want to go to free agency and then sign with a team that gives you a future that that tells you you're going to you're going to succeed in the NHL you're going to go to playoffs you're going to be a big part of something whereas now the Canadians they're not they're probably not going to be that good next year in fact maybe they'll they'll tank you know we thought they were going to sign a bunch of free agents and then they sold off um Arturi Lekin and Brett Kulak so we don't know where they're going to be but if you're looking at the team and you're going all right we've got uh, Marty St. Louis, we're building this development department, we're hiring a skills person, you know, we've got all of these people that are going to be in touch with each other, and we're going to talk about this tomorrow. There's a fantastic article by Arpin Basu uh, about Kent Hughes, and it talks about his vision for development, and we're going to talk a little bit about the details on tomorrow's episode because we're running out of time on this one, but... That vision, if a guy showed up to me and was like, you're ready to join our organization, we don't want you to go to free agency, here's our long-term plan, short and long-term plan for the future. In the next couple of months, this is, these are the steps we're going to take. In the next two years, these are the steps you're going to take, we're going to take. I feel good about signing with that team. When it's a general manager who right now or at the time was mired in a bunch of controversy and like staring down failure and couldn't figure out how to write the ship that doesn't look good to me as a player and i'm like i'll go to free agency and i'm going to look at who looks like the best team and i'll talk to that and i think that's the biggest thing is having long-term foresight and planning is such an incredible asset and kent hughes is a people person he's a player agent first and foremost he knows how important the little things are to players and i i i love this uh the, this little quotation here at the end of the article that says the now former Huskies captain was watched the likes of blue liners, Cam Fowler, Matt Grizzlick, and Miro Heiskin and closely over the years. Uh, three names that I do very much enjoy having potentially on the blue line in the form of Harris won't be rushed into action by St. Louis. The hall of famer indicated that Harris will be slowly integrated into the mix, which we will see uh, that should give him a little extra downtime to finish his final college class and organizational behavior to graduate with a, uh, with a business administration degree in May. So one hats off to being uh, Jordan Harrison graduating with that degree. It's always good to have something to fall back on. And one last thing I want to mention before we wrap up today's show, the PWHPA is playing in Montreal this weekend. Please, if you can go check out the revamp Verdun auditorium, it is gorgeous. It's really good hockey. It's some of the best uh, women's hockey players in the world. You're not going to want to miss it. If I didn't mention on this show, I'd feel like I'd be doing myself a disservice. And I'm going. Else. Laura, you'll have to tell us all about that. Please, <laughs> um, please bask in the awe of Marie Philippe Poulin for me. She's I know not going to be there, sadly, but all the others are. Well, at um, the same time, her aura still reigns over the city of Montreal. True. So that's that's where she like that that's where she develops her hockey. I, I don't know how it works, but like it, it's a beautiful revamped hockey program. It's not just an arena anymore. Um, and we're so excited. And um, if you were there, please say hi, but don't be a creep. Yes, uh, I <laughs> please check it out. Laura will tell us all about it on Monday's episode. So. Uh, as for now, we're going to wrap it up for the day. Please make sure you subscribe when you're watching this on YouTube. We're trying to get in close to 500 so we can make Laura eat something gross. Uh, please follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Canadians. You can follow Laura at The Active Stick and myself at Scott Matla. Please tweet us your mailbag questions for Friday's show. It's always one of our favorite shows of the week. And when you're done making us your first listen of the day, go check out Lockdown Fantasy Hockey so you too can dominate your fantasy hockey league to this season and beyond.